Welcome, everybody, to the PWZ Podcast. I want to welcome AJ Petruzzi to the show. From what I understand, this is your first ever podcast appearance. You're the first. Well, I want to say thank you very much for that. Uh, it is an honor and a pleasure to be sitting here with you today talking. Well, it's something different. Let's see how this works out, sir. <laughs> well, uh, first, we're going to start off. We're going to go through your career a little bit. Uh, but I first want to say that uh, you, I've been informed by you when we were setting this up that uh, let's shoot off with this first. You're, you're going to be uh, inducted into the Carbon County Sports Hall of Fame. Yeah, that's uh, the end of the month, the 28th of this Sunday. Uh, it's, it's where it all started here in Carbon County back in the day. That's where you started your career? Kind of, sort of. Uh, I can thank my good friend Tom Chapman. Okay. He's the one that uh, kind of sort of started with the wrestling career, but my original career, I played everything here in, in Carbon County. Uh, Wikipedia tells it all. I mean, you can go on there if you didn't search already. I played football, baseball, basketball, teener. I coached uh, Babe Ruth League with my little brother, and uh, it all started here in Carbon County to, to where I went back later on in life. It's amazing. And uh, I do have some notes here. Uh, actually, I have plenty of notes here. But uh, I said that you grew up in Pennsylvania and that you graduate, graduated from uh, Jim Thorpe High School. And uh, you competed in football, basketball, and you were a wrestler for school as well. I was, yes. I was pretty good in wrestling, actually. Really? Uh, and then, um, of course, in 1983, you were trained under the uh, legendary Tony Altimore. How did that all come about in your professional career? That's true, too. You know, back before 83, I could say I was actually laid off from Bethlehem Steel Corporation where I used to work. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got pretty well out of shape. I was over 300 plus pounds, you know, drinking and things like that, that we were, we were waiting to get a call, back, a call back to work. And my father said to me the one time, he said, listen, if you're waiting to get called back to work, this could be a long time. So you better get your ass moving. So I took that kind of sorta and I stopped alcohol, booze, started working out. And ironically, this should be a book. I started jogging and I used to jog up on North Street in, the Pen in Jim Thorpe here, right across from Jim Thorpe's monument, this continental Lincoln pulls up. And uh, I, I thought they were looking for directions. And they rolled the window down and who's sitting in the front passenger seat but Chief J. Strongbow. And in the back seat was this guy who I knew forever, Tom Chapman, who ended up to be a WWF referee that nobody knew about. So he, he says to me, he goes, hey, these guys want to talk to you. I said, why? What do you need? You know, and Tom says, well, I guess uh, with me helping them out there and you, you're a big Italian guy, they'd like to talk to you about come into Madison Square Garden to watch a show. And I said, yeah, right. And then I started running again. So they pulled up a little bit further, and my buddy Tom says, listen, I'm serious. I'll take you there, and uh, I'll take you and my son, and we'll go to Madison Square Garden. Chief will hook everything up here. We'll be right at ringside. I didn't know he was a referee in that capacity yet. So we get there, and he sets our – his son and myself in the front row seat, and I'll never forget. I'm looking at one of the main events was Snooker against Slaughter, diving off the steel cage into the into the mat. Well, when it was all said and done, here comes Tom out to do a referee, and in a, I don't know what to think because I really wasn't. I thought, wow, you know what's going on here. So on the way home, he said to me, "He goes, the, they're wrestling." in Ag Hall in Pennsylvania to do television taping. They'd like to see you down there with a couple of other people. I said, okay. So we go down there at Ag Hall. And who's in there? Everybody of the big shots of the world there. And uh, Tony Altimore takes over and he meets us. Dave Barbie from Philadelphia was a power lifter. Seth Cohen from New York City. He was huge. He was a big dude. And they said, we're going to... We have a camp up in Orange, Connecticut, run by Kenny Passarello's Quest, was the name of the place. Yep. We would like you guys to come up and take a look and see if this is what 
you're interested. Well, we went up. Tom Chapman, the referee, excuse me, drives up. We get up there and we meet everybody in the gym, and there's the ring. Awesome. You know, I'm thinking, gee, you know, I'm no young guy anymore. I'm 29 years old. And to think about it, being laid off, I got to do something. I did sell my 66 Corvette convertible to go to the school. So we paid for the school. Seth Cohen's father got us an apartment building. So we stayed there and a little be little, everything started to get in, going crazy. And since I had amateur background in three months, I would always look on Tony Altimore's book. Oh man, Phillipsburg, New Jersey, you're coming up this weekend. We'll, we'll be home, show up there, which I did. And I thought, oh, this is awesome. You know, Tom Chapman's a referee, good friends with the chief. And uh, I'm sitting in the bleachers, and the chief comes over and says, get down to the dressing room. Whoa, I don't even have my clothes yet. I got a pair of boots. He says, get down to the dressing room. Somebody didn't show up, as they did a lot back then. So I go downstairs, and there's Tony Atlas, Monster, and this and that. And uh, I forget all the, the talent that was there, but – I think it was, he said to me, you're on against B. Brian Blair. Oh, one of the killer bees. You know, I'm thinking, I'm just a rookie. These guys have been around. But anyway, I talked to Brian. He said, what do you know? I said, well, I've been up there three months. We worked out a match. I forget who the heck was it that came over. Um, Iron Mike Sharp come over with a pair of trunks. He says, here, wear this. So I went in. We went in the match, had a 20-minute match, and he went over then. And we get back to the dressing room in Baltimore. They all come over, and they said, looks like the new blood's in town, right? Well, we don't know what this is. I was scared, like, my shorts off. So I thought, wow, I'm going to get paid, right? <laughs> I go back in the bleachers. I sit with Tom, and Baltimore comes out, and Chief comes out, and they, they everybody leaves. I, hey, I didn't get paid. They said, that's your induction. <laughs> that's how it, that was the first match, and that was awesome. Uh, I also have here one of your earliest matches was in uh, Allentown, Pennsylvania, August 15th, 1984. You uh, took on Charlie Fulton. Do you yes. have, a, have any re recollection of this? Let me tell you something. Charlie Fulton was one of the top-notch guys. Mm -hmm. that us young guys at the time got to – it was just – he was so knowledgeable. And he said to me, and he always talked in a real low voice. And he would say, hey, Petrusi, are you ready? We're going to go out there and have a good time. Good time? What are we doing? You'll get it. <laughs> <laughs> but he was, uh, he was awesome. What a guy. And he was friends also with this Tom Chapman. Now, this Tom Chapman used to work at Mack Trucks. So a lot of the wrestlers, when they would come into the locker rooms, they'd have Mack Truck bags for their clothing. They'd have Mack truck knives with lanterns on it. I mean, it was one of those that he was in a new people. And I tell you, I keep saying this, but if it wasn't for him, then none of this would have happened. But anyway, it did happen. And uh, wow, what a ride. Read about the Northern Wrestling Federation in the book presented by Russellville.com, the, the Pro, Pro Wrestling, Wrestling Fall, Volume 2. Hear the story of Roger Ruffin, the man who trained Carl Anderson, Anderson the Monster Abyss, Jordan Clearwater, Clearwater Chris, Chris Harris, and Jillian Hall. Plus 45 other short stories, including Jazz, Bobby Eaton, Kamala, Thunder Rosa, Mario Mancini, Scott Casey, PJ Black, Kerry Morton, Sal Renaro, Jeremiah Plunkett, Colby Carino, Bam Bam Malone, and many others. Get your book today at Russellville.com. Russellville, it's where wrestling lives. Now, this might be a really odd one here, but it's uh, in uh, 1984 in Middletown, Connecticut. You took a, uh, let's see, hang on. It was, uh, you, I guess you defeated Ron Sexton in his one of his only recorded losses in WWF. Ron you were, Sexton, yeah, he was, he was up in age a little bit at this point. Yeah. And, uh, actually, when we would go on the areas, when we were still in the school and we were up in that north East or Northwest, yeah, Northeastern. Yep. The chief 
in Altimore would set up the shows. And they were kind of sort of pruning at the time to see how we would do. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we'd be sitting in a dressing room and uh, uh, the chief would come up to me anyway and say, look, at you see that son of a gun up there in the top of the bleachers? By the time your match starts, you should have him coming down after you as the heel. And we learned how to really antagonize people. Right. But it was good because with Antonio Altimore, he was one of the craziest heels of the century, you might as well say, because he was amazing at his age and to do what he did with us. So you obviously mentioned uh, Kenny Passarello's gym in Orange, Connecticut. Uh, I know someone else that uh, obviously who's, you know, um, I don't know what you want to say, affiliated with it. Obviously, Mario Mancini uh, worked yeah. there as well. Mario Mancini, Paul Roma. Yep. Uh, Dr. D, David uh, Schultz, I believe, was associated over there as well. Yeah. Uh, yep. The strongest guy in the world at that time, Ted Arcidi. Okay. Him. Actually, we had some uh, professional football people at the time, too, we trained. Rod Taylor from Texas A&M. And some, uh, some guy that became a quarterback, I think his name was uh, uh, Miami Dolphins. <laughs> uh, I'm thinking, geez, where are these guys coming from? Evidently, they were up in uh, Connecticut doing some kind of training or whatever. Danny mm -hmm. Marino was the name. Oh, yeah, I remember that guy. <laughs> yeah, he came in with us, too. And it was interesting. And there was a lot of guys that were – Hogan would come in, Sal Baloma would come in and give some time in there. And we had some lower card people, uh, Gino Cabell, Carbell, Carabello. Yep. And when we used to fly to Canada and at the Maple Leaf Gardens, the signs were A.J. Petrucci, Gino Carabello, Mario Mancini, and holy mackerel, what these guys are seeing us, even though, you know, we, we were just starting to do TV taping. Right. What a, what a trip. What a rush. I wish, I wish everybody could have an experience. <laughs> That era the, between 84 and 85 is when the WWF was like really taking off and becoming a national, uh, you know, a national thing. So right. what was it like, you know, being part of that? Uh, I mean, you guess, I guess you were like, a, I'd consider you a very important part of that, uh, that era. Well, it was different, you know, because of the fact that the time they didn't have a lot of Italians. Mm -hmm. Bruno was on his decline out of the road, out of the world with the other, the other guys, uh, Dominic Danucci and all them guys. And when I first got in there with all this group, they said, we're going to change your last name to put from CCI to ZZI. And I thought, well, hey, you know, whatever that takes, that's what you got to do. But we were even in the first JBL dolls. We made those. We were we were up doing TV tape and, and – uh, Gee, I can't. Tim Timmy White was the uh, yep. Andre around forever, and yep. he called and said, "We want you and Barbie and a whole bunch of these guys to do this commercials. We're going to do the when they first come out with the dolls back then." So that was so interesting because we were there with the Sheik and Hogan and Doctor D Schultz and uh, Sergeant Slaughter and Snooker. I mean, it was the cream of the crop back then. But yeah, we were at the point where. Chief used to tell us young guys, if you can last five years, you'll be okay. They'll be taken care of. Well, you know, a lot of guys don't make it five years. We were lucky enough, some of us, like Mario, myself, Roma got a hell of a push. Yeah. And uh, Jim Powers, him and Roma were actually teamed up together. Yep. There were quite a few back in the day that, to, to recall everything, we'd have to go in our archives, but it was the start where all of a sudden we were picked to do commercials out in Hollywood. They're flying us out there. We're doing, we're working out at Venice Beach, and all of a sudden we're doing these commercials for Toyota trucks, Chevys, and God, holy macro, this is good. And got and we got paid for it. That was great. So yeah, we were at the at that time where it was just starting to get. Super big again since the older group was sliding off. And the opportunities, I think on our first contact, I told you about that fracture Franzberg that I was picking. Yes. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I can show you something here. Where are we? Up a little. Yep. There you go. 
This is Fracture Fransburg, upstate New York. The guys on the bottom, there's the uh, the Italian guy that they used to kind of sort of as a gimmick and the two radio station. And we were under cover, under a mask, because they didn't want us to know who we were. And they said, well, you're going to go over all the time. What? You're going to win. And then when I first went to New York and saw my name on the dressing room door, I thought, oh, my God, this could be it. And uh, it wasn't for quite a while. We were starting to beat quite a few people. Unfortunately, they sent me over to Australia. Was it Australia? Yeah, Australia for a tour. And Mario Mancini stepped in and wore the gimmick. And for some reason, then they killed him. After we were, I thought maybe it was going to keep going, but who knows what corporate thinks. Yeah, what gimmick was that exactly? Like, I'm trying to, re I don't that recall. Was a, it was a uh, radio station, of course, free publicity for WWF. Right. And they had this gimmick that a mafia character died upstate New York. <laughs> And he had a will that was about 18 pages long. Right. And at the end of the at the end of the the paper, it said they owned a wrestler by the name of Fracture Fransberg. Okay. And nobody knew who it was. Right. Because there wasn't. It was a it was a good thing for the publicity. And when I would walk out to the ring, it was amazing because the Godfather went first. The owners of the, the station went with us and. It was crazy because it, it was, you know, we didn't know what to do. And I, at the first, I think it was the first couple of matches, I was wearing a, a glove that made it look like a, like a hard punch glove. And yeah. Rene Goulet was crazy. He said, who the hell told you to wear that? That's my gimmick. You can't do that. And we're sitting up there, and I was supposed to work with Jim Powers. I believe that was the time. And... Uh, Gorilla Monsoon was the agent, and he told Grenade, yo, that's what Vince wants. What, what do you mean that's what Vince wants? So Gorilla calls Vince up on the phone up there. I don't remember what time it was in upstate New York, and he puts it on, gives it to Renee. You leave Petrucci go. That's what we want. They're, they're the ones taking care of it, and that's staying. Well, Bruno didn't like it either. He said, you got a goddamn Italian here. We need more Italians out there. Well, the gimmick that worked for a while until, again, I said I left overseas. And for some reason, they killed it. Yeah. And you know what? When we did come back out of, from overseas, though, we were out of a job. We kind of sort of were, were like in limbo. And uh, Dave Barbie, they shipped him up to Canada with Stu Hart's crew. And when they brought him back, I just came back from down south, and I said to Dave, and Vince was in the dressing room. It was awesome out in Hershey Park. And he said, hey, Petrucci, I guess you jumped ship a little bit. I said, well, you know, we didn't have any work here. And don't they kill Barbie that night? You were supposed to wear a mask, and they, they killed him too. So we'll never know what corporate thinks down the road, no matter what. And they had a lot of invested in Dave Barbie. This was yeah. one of the strongest SOBs I've seen in my life. And then they just squashed him. They just squashed him. But he wow. did take, he did, I think I mentioned that a while back too. They did take him over to Austria and they wanted him to fight Otto Wants. I think I said that. Yep. I think he said that to me before. Yep. And Dave even said that uh, they paid for everything over there. And Otto talked to him and he was 400 plus pounds. And they said, he said to Dave, can you slam me? Yeah. So Dave does. And I said that also that. Otto said, do it again. Well, that's twice. <coughs> and the sad part of the story is he didn't. He performed when he went to leave. The money guy was gone. He had to send home to get his capital to fly from Austria back to the States. So what the hell's going on? But again, corporate is corporate. We don't know. Right. Don't know. Uh, so what year was that about? 86-ish? 85? Because I think you yeah. left... It's on YouTube now. Dave yeah. Barbie and Otto wants. He okay. just contacted me last year, and he said, because I thought he died. And we right. were contacted, and he says, yeah, I'm just starting to get some some uh, publicity about overseas. But uh, I said to him, you want to come back? He said, no, we're done. We had it. No more wrestling. And he was 
they, they tried to make him a, a Russian or a German. That's what it was because he looked like one. But again, we have no control. We do what we're told and hope for the best. So you left the WWF in what, uh, 1987, correct? Is that about right? Uh, 86, maybe? Yeah, somewhere in there. I was back, actually, I was when I come back from Australia, I was called back to Bethlehem Steel to work. Okay. And when I was back there, it was in that, that time frame, I get a call from Pat Patterson. He said, we're doing a movie down in Georgia with Hulk Hogan. Okay. Uh, we'd like you to come down there. We'll pay you X amount of dollars. And I said, well, I'm sorry. You know, I'm back to work now at Bethlehem Steel. We're, we had years in already. And uh, what are you going to do? I mean, I had a family. We had to make ends meet. So we kind of sort of turned that down. And the movie Hogan made down there with oh, the big black guy, Zeus. Uh, yeah, uh, No Holes Barred. Yep. No Holes Barred. So we probably could have been in there, but then again, we would have been probably extras because Stan Hansen was there. And if you remember the movie, he comes out of the bathroom with toilet paper hanging from him. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it made you really look cheesy. Yeah. You know, not like when we were doing the commercials out in uh, Los Angeles there at Hollywood. That was real. That was real, real. But yeah, around that time, I think. Ron Shaw was a good friend of mine also. We teamed up a lot over the years. And he said to me with Larry Winters, he said, let's go down to Crockett Production. We made a contact down there with, boy, I can't think of the guy's name, Gary Juster. Okay, yeah. And uh, they said, you guys come down. It was myself, Ron, and Larry Winters. So the three of us, we go down there. We go, in the, we go in the locker room, and who the hell's in there? There's Rick Flair, there's Stan Hansen, all the guys that were up north are now down south with before WCW. So we go in the dressing room, and Ron uh, sent me a little insight that uh, we did work with Sean Royal and Todd Champion, the new breed, I think they were called. Yes, new breed, yep. And we were already on TV a lot with Vince, and we get in the dressing room, and these two young guys come up to us and said, hey, listen, you guys are the guys. You, you guys have been everywhere. Whatever you want to do, we're with you. And then the promoter at the time, I don't remember who it was down there, but they said, uh, 20 minutes, and they're going over. How you get there, it's up to you. We had one hell of a match. Yeah. It was awesome. But then again – the pay scale from there to up here, they didn't like us down the south. They did. Yeah. Because when uh, I was alone with Larry, we'd go to Waldorf, Maryland, and places down there, and they just they didn't care for us because we're northern from up north. Yeah. It's like the old back in the day, southern, northern, but we all were the same. You know, we intermingled. I mean, I never met Flair till I was down there. And uh, he's, he was all right. I mean, nobody really – you think that they would be animosity, but what the hell, everybody's the same. Right. So we had a, a short stay, not really promising. Let's go there. But we were there. And we were uh, – I was myself as A.J. Petrucci, and Ron was Ron. So, uh, yeah, we were, did a couple of shows down there, but it just wasn't – it wasn't feasible. Hi, this is Bob Smith. You might remember me from my years at Pro Wrestling Illustrated Magazine. Well, now I've started a brand new podcast called The Outdated Wrestling Hour. Yes, we're going to take a whimsical look back at the wrestling figures, stars, and trends from years gone by. We're talking 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and a whole lot more. There's going to be laughs. There's going to be fun. There's going to be action. You name it. Please tune in for The Outdated Wrestling Hour wherever you get your podcasts. I had Ron Shaw on the podcast about two months ago, and we, we covered a bit of that. Uh, I guess it didn't last too long, right? No. The yeah, we were jumping around to the Mike Danos, the NWF. Yes. We, yeah. we were the executioners, which we've done several places in our time, in the early times. And uh, it was pretty big down there. I mean, they were bringing people in from Abdul the Butcher uh, before he got killed. Oh, my God. What the hell was his name? Uh, Brody. Which one? 
Oh, Bruiser Brody, yep. They bring him, and this guy was, you know what I mean? We got to see, and again, we were really not many years into the business, and we're, we're seeing these guys that are televised all over the world. But we had some moments there. We kind of sort of took a couple of hits, and then we beat, I think, the Fantastics for the belts, and then we moved on. Uh, the Fantastics had the United States belts uh, at the time period, I think around 80, 88, maybe? 87, 88? Yeah. It could be a, yeah, it could yeah. be because I know yeah. they were building up something. Oh. They were leaving. They had to leave to go somewhere. I'm talking. I'm sorry. You, you're talking uh, in the NWF. They ended up. Yeah, I believe that you guys at the Executioners ended up defeating them for the uh, NWF belts tag team. Yes, belts. yes, yeah. that's true. Yep. Yeah, that's, I mean that's they had everybody. Over, they had everybody over there. Uh, uh, even um, uh, DC Mad Dog Drake, Gary Michael Capetta was ring announcing at the time period as well. It was. Uh, I think that in that promotion was. Uh, there's something a little bit different about it. You know what I mean? It was kind of edgy. I guess you can compare it to, uh, I guess, ECW prior to ECW in a way. Yeah, that's true. And you know what? Edgy. There, there was a group that used to come in from Pittsburgh when they were doing TV taping down there. And one of the saddest things that I ever witnessed was uh, one of the wrestlers dying mm -hmm. in the ring. They brought him out. I don't know if he had a heart attack, threw him in the cold shower and, I'll never forget that. That was, I'm thinking, man, we take some chances. And we did. I mean, even st stuff that we did at, in the old ECW places. But, yeah, that was one of the most heartening things that I ever seen. And it made you think. It really did. But yeah, we go on. Uh, what do, what was it like working with the Fantastics there? Fast, them guys were. We were we were big and and brutal, and they were fast as lightning. I mean, they were tagging in and out faster than we can watch our, the clock on the wall. I mean, they were just amazing. Uh, the one died young too. I can't remember. Bobby uh, Tommy Rogers, Bobby Fulton's still alive. He's going through some health issues. Uh, but he's working with the current NWA product, um, and now I guess his. Uh, I just saw his son got a job there doing. Uh, I don't know doing what, but um, Tommy, I mean, Bobby rather is, uh, you know, being used in the NWA currently, but uh, not as an active performer on um, on camera. So as an authority figure type. That's, yeah, nostalgia like they do. Yeah. But, but yeah, that was, uh, they were great. Man, yeah. if we were just younger. I always, I always say that. It's a shame we got to get old. <laughs> but it is. <laughs> uh, what about uh, work with Rocky Jones and Terry Daniels? Uh, in the NWF, do you remember recall working them? Yeah, I remember Daniel. What the heck? He was with the uh, Sergeant Slaughter there for how long? Yeah, for a while. Another yeah, more guys. Uh, yeah, we should have stuck around longer. Mike Dano's group there that was running most of and DC Drake. He was behind the scenes too. Yep. It, you know, it was some of the old timers that were there. Jewel Strongbow was always there. Uh, Cousin Luke, the hillbilly. Uh, and I used to tease Cousin Luke all the time. Yo, you forget that uh, me and Hogan trained Hillbilly Jim back in uh, 85 or 6 or something. He say, yeah, but things change. And they do. You know, yeah. it's amazing how the Southern guys, where he came from down south. And uh, it was such a learning process with all these guys. Today, I don't know. I watched a little bit today, and I'm thinking, what are they thinking? 59 high spots in a half a half an hour? Come yeah. on. Where's the story? Where's the old write that book? Let's go back the way things were. But again, within with Drake and them, it was kind of like that, except for him and uh, Larry Winters. They were nuts. I get Drake was at that time period was having a feud with, I believe, uh, Jules Strongbow, right? Didn't they wrestle in a cage yes, uh, at right. that time period? And they had a really good story and a really good feud, I thought, uh, watching that stuff. And they went all over, too. We were all yeah. over Jersey. We were all over New York. And uh, it just, it's hard to explain to the people who are trying to get in today. Mm -hmm. When you're with a big organization and you know how it's run, we could walk in any of our dressing rooms back in the day. You could hear a pin drop. Today, you walk in the dressing room and everybody's screaming and yelling and this and that. What the hell's going on? I wasn't like that when I ran the ECW locker room. You know, what's the deal? I don't understand it. Who trained you? Where are you coming from? 
But again, people will do anything to try and get in. And that's that's not right. One of the, one of the big things is like social media as well, making videos for social media, whether it be TikTok, Facebook, uh, Instagram, all that stuff to try to get attention and try to get themselves over. That's stuff that I don't know about, thank God. <laughs> like I said, this is my first podcast ever, and I really don't like to be out there mm -hmm. kind of sort of. We did what we did. I was the first ever from our area to become to sign with a, a few others. And with Drake's, we had uh, Doug Flex from the Heighton five miles away. He got in. Actually, Ron, Ron Shaw trained him, and Larry Winters trained him. Uh, and he, we were doing the NFL or uh, the NWL stuff with, with Dano, but there wasn't many here. And when I look back, boy, I was a lucky son of a gun. I was just lucky. And who knew how 30 years and I'm still playing. This is crazy, yeah. but I like it. Yeah. Uh, there's a big difference. I know you mentioned like the product today. It's a big difference between – your era or when I was growing up watching and today, like you said, 50 high spots and uh, everybody's got to do three flips, four flips before they actually land a move. Uh, how many super kicks? It's uh, like you said, they're, they're not telling a story in right. this match. Exactly. You know? I don't know what yeah. they're looking at. I mean, longevity is not going to be there. When I see Matt Riddle and yeah. he trained here a little bit in Pennsylvania, not far from me, mm -hmm. and I see what he goes through and did go through. Wow. No way. I mean, even years ago, when you know they they uh, they were bleeding, yeah, people were getting cut. Well, you don't see no no cuts in my head. The mask made a difference. You can't yeah. bleed through the mask. But it was uh, it was it's a different game. It is. Like you said, no longevity. There's a kid that works out of this area, and he just constantly diving over the ropes and taking high risks. You know, he one day climbed on top of. Uh, I don't know, up a couple shelves or whatever you want to call it and took a dive. And it's scary to watch because you don't know what's going to happen when that person lands, you know, and it's not, uh, they might be getting a pop from the crowd, but what's next? You know what I mean? Was they got to try online. something bigger. There was something online here about draws. Remember draws? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Uh, they had something on them. Now, actually my wife's friend, that's a nurse in Philadelphia took care of him. He's in one of those motorized carts. He's done. Yeah, I saw him. Did you? Did I, well, they did like a they did a TV special on him. I think it was Dark Side of the Ring, maybe oh, or okay. something like that. And uh, they did a whole and uh, yeah, man, I feel bad for that guy. And like you said, he's in a in a wheelchair permanently. Yeah, he's done uh, D'Lo Brown. He was working with, if I remember. Yeah, he I guess he slipped when he was going for a move, and that just messed up the yeah. whole thing. Yeah, you wonder. Yeah. But anyway, that's the yeah. way it is. Uh, tell me about becoming the Super Destroyers and going to ECW. Well, Ron Shaw was with me when we first went down there as the executioners. And we were put over a little bit. But then all of a sudden, Ron, I guess he wanted to do different things and left. So in the meantime, I found a partner out of Hagerstown, Maryland, Doug Stahl. Doug was like a six-foot five, six, seven golden gloves boxer in the military. He kind of was a little bit bigger than I was tall wise. And uh, Todd Gordon says, uh, we'll give you a manager and you guys figure out what to do. Well, we got Robin Q. Hunter III was our manager and we come up with the Super Destroyer, ECW Super Destroyers, because down south years ago there was, the Irwins were the Super Destroyers. Right, yep. And again, we we kind of sort of meshed together as a team. And with my background and him, he worked for WCW for a while, Doug, because I remember his match with Ron Simmons back in the day. And uh, we started to get some good pops all of a sudden. Mike Smith's sports bars where we used to do taping. Then when you go to the Cabrini Colleges, and little by little, all of a sudden, here comes uh, Nikolai Volkov, Stone Cold Steve Austin before he was super. He was the ringmaster. Uh -huh. Snuka was coming in Morocco. I mean, the old tapes that were just amazing. And the, we're getting pops, and all of a sudden, you know, we're, we're 
starting to – we're winning. I mean, we're beating people. We're Chris Candido and his partner, Johnny Hotbody, and Chris Michaels and all these people. And next thing you know, we're the longest reigning ECW tag team champs in history to this day. Even when Vince bought him out, he didn't – he didn't pursue it, I guess. And I thought we lost it. And then the same night, I think we won it back down in ECW. But we had such a pop. It got a little bit out of hand, though, when the violence started coming in. That was that was kind of sort of – you could see the writing on the wall. And then Todd brought in Eddie Gilbert. But mm-hmm. at first, I think, brought in – the Crockett's. The Crockett's were there one big show down in Philadelphia at the arena. Okay. And uh, I think Eddie Gilbert was just brought in then, and he was doing some of the booking. And then all hell broke loose when all these other guys took off and Paul Heyman came in. Then we knew it was over. <laughs> and I actually, Paul Heyman was one of my managers when we were with Vince up in the New England States, and we were starting out as the executioners. Oh, I still okay. got pictures of him. It was just a little run back then. But when you think about it today, when he came in, he actually sat down, brought us all in a dressing room, said, you guys have been here since the beginning. You have nothing to worry about. <laughs> Next thing I know, people were leaving left and right, and he was bringing in Christ, Mike Awesome, Taz, Dreamer and all the guys. And that's one thing that irks me to this day. And I'm not, and I don't get upset too often. They're claiming the originals. Now, maybe there's a misconception when I believe in originals, but we started from Eastern to extreme and we were the originals. And when I hear that, that just gets me wound up. You wouldn't believe because we're warriors. Yeah. We're warriors. But anyway. It was uh, NWA Eastern Championship Wrestling at the time. And I remember that. It was a, an, an NWA affiliate when it, it was, first started. Yeah. Uh, you know, Joel Goodhart. Yeah. He was he uh, he ran Tri State Wrestling and then shut it down. And then right. I think and that's, that's where and then that's the, where um, um Tanya Gordon ended up forming ECW. Right. Yeah. I remember yeah. I remember going down for the first or second time. Did you remember do you remember um, – now, have you watched the uh, Chubby Dudley podcast on YouTube at all? I do. Actually, he, yeah. he just texted me a couple of months ago and said, we just put you guys over. And he showed a few yes. things. And I thought, who's getting this stuff? Again, I'm not you know, really up to this stuff here. Right. But I, there was one thing, I think it's on my uh, – on the Wikipedia that they wrote up, that in actuality, when we were – the tag team champs for ECW, we went against the NWA. Oh, what was his name? And we beat their champions. We held the two belts for two organizations at one time. Dennis Carluzzo. Yeah. Yep. That's who the group was. NWA Northeast or West or whatever. And I, I'll, I'll never I think forget. he was the, the president at the time. And then uh, there was a separation. Dennis, um, well, when the NWA tournament happened, the title tournament happened, then there was a separation between uh, ECW and the NWA because I guess that's uh, bec- because of Shane Douglas throwing the NWA belt down. Uh, yeah, that was at the end. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we were on our way. Uh, we were on our way out the door when they had a mask versus match mask where I had to unmask my partner, <laughs> and that was we knew it was over. Then you know, I mean, we yeah. were doing interviews with Sherry Martell and. and even myself one on one, and then Doug had his mask taken off, and they tried to make him some kind of a oh my god, like a lumberjack. But it was right, it didn't, it didn't work. It was time, it was time to move on. Available on all streaming platforms, it's professional wrestling's greatest, largest, privately owned wrestling library. All the classic hits, flips, slams, and pins of yesteryear are on one place. It's Ultimate Classic Wrestling. Check out the Nature Boy Ric Flair, Hulk Hogan, Mr. USA Tony Atlas, Tito Santana, Rick Martel, a who's who of professional wrestling's greatest spotlight stars ever to grace the squared circle all in one place. Grab the best seat in the house for memories and mayhem on Ultimate Classic Wrestling.
it was a different, it was a shifting product. It would be ended it, like you said, more hardcore and violence and stuff. And they were bringing in, they started bringing in luchadors and guys, you know, like uh, Chris Benoit and stuff like that. Yeah, it, it was a change. I mean, we were getting old already. We were getting up in age too, but hey, <laughs> you know, when I think back and I look at some of the films, we just, Doug and I did a show in West Virginia here a couple of months ago. And it was like nothing, you know, I still do the flip off the ropes to, for the finish. And it, it's just that it's a shame we got to get old. That's the only thing. It's a shame we got to get old because actually you see they're hiring a lot of people back with Vince. I just saw the headbangers were brought back. And yeah. Something to do with uh, nostalgia or whatever. I thought, well, maybe the people are sick and tired of the craziness. I don't know. I guess we'll find out. To an extent, I'd have to agree. I mean, there's also uh, a market for nostalgia in the in the modern era. Some of the older fans, and you know, it's all a lot of stuff that they read about. You know, guys like I just watched. Um, you know, Tommy Fierro. You remember yeah. him? Yeah, yeah. Fierro is he still around? Oh yeah. Well, he he was gone for a few years. Now he's back. And I was watching a live stream of one of his shows. And one of his matches, he had a tag team, current tag team, the now, and they were facing. The powers of pain and the headed bangers in a triple threat match in a three way match. So I was like, uh, yeah, I mean, he had he holds his 80s wrestling con every year. I know Mario was up there, I believe, yesterday, and he had a lot of legends taking part. He had held three wrestling events back to back to back, mm. and uh, a lot of legends took place in the in the uh, in the matches. Well, let's see what happens down the road. Uh, I'm waiting to get the call here. Uh, probably for one of those inductions up in upstate New York to see, because a couple people asked, how come you guys weren't inducted in any of the big, big shots? You guys are the longest reigning champs in history. Yeah. It doesn't matter because they make the rules and regulations. Now, if we probably would, we didn't know it at the time, but Paulie was working with Vince. Yeah. Not like uh, the head was there. What's his name? Uh, Al Snow. Guys mm -hmm. that were just devout. Oh, uh, CM Punk. They mm -hmm. brought, he went down to ECW to get everything trained up too. So it was just inevitable Vince was going to buy everybody out so that he'd be the only sole survivor. And he has. It didn't necessarily work, really. I mean, you only have one product. It was kind of a drag to watch because they didn't have any competition. So they didn't have to improve themselves. You catch well, what I'm saying? Yeah. When the territories back in the 80s, my buddies, the Nasty Boys, were out there at Vern Gagne. And yeah. they would, they'd always, like Ted Petty, the Cheetah Kid, and all them people were trying to get in with Vince. We Again, we were so lucky that we had somebody that spoke for us to try and get that first try. But them guys, the territories, it was just, wow, you could go to Florida. You can go to California. You can go to Minnesota. You can go everywhere because everybody kind of sort of had their own thing going on. But Vince Sr. decided, well... I don't know, remember what I remember when he passed away, but we I was with Sal Baloma when he passed away. And uh he started Vince Jr. started buying and bringing a talent, period. Next right. thing all the guys with the big shots were gone. Jesse Ventura, Hulk Hogan, Colonel De Beers, there's a name out of the past. Yep. From up in Oregon, uh Billy Jack Hayes, all them guys, they had their own thing. And some of us would leave to go up there and hear and all over. The experience was was there. I just, uh, I liked it here on the East Coast or North or down Florida, but it just, it just, you got to pick and choose. That's right. the way it is. I hate to say that, but uh, after so many years in the business, you can just say, no, I don't, yeah. I don't need it. And yep. that's good now today. People want to do something. And we don't mind going to organizations and putting people over. I know we had our time. Nobody can take it away from us. We're good. Even Mario, when we speak now in the blue moon, and I said, you're just a goddamn kid yet. And he'd laugh. He goes, I was how old? That's 40-some years ago. But, you know, it was, it was a hell of a – I can't say it enough. It was one hell of a ride. 
Yeah. Yeah. It was definitely a great time. There's lots of great stuff going on and it's uh, nothing compares that time. If you're comparing it to today, you know, no, no. I mean, all this over, I was never overseas. I didn't join the military back in our day. They had a lottery. I was 365. I was never told to go. Next thing you know, we're in New Zealand. We're in Saudi Arabia. We're Egypt. Whoa, this is good. You know, and I'm getting paid to do this. This was great. They were good. And usually when we went overseas, Tim White, I don't know if you know Tim White. He was the hammer. Uh, yeah. He, he was just that. inducted into the Hall of Fame this past, uh, this past well, last month uh, during WrestleMania weekend, uh, the WWE Hall of Fame. And wow. he was one of the earliest uh, WWF employees, actually, if uh, you've ever heard his story. Yeah. Probably in the early what late seventies, early eighties, uh, under Vince, uh, senior, uh, Vince McMahon Jr. Yeah, see, I don't yeah. remember. He was our handler every time we went overseas. Yeah, he, he was. He, he used to come here in Pennsylvania with the limo and pick Andre the the giant up. Yep. And his, limo, his limousine then was bought by Sal Bolomo. It was crazy. <laughs> <clears throat> it was just wow. And I used to sell the cars to these guys because I'm. You know, I'm a car guy, and uh, they used to come to me, not at it's over the fact, uh, what's his name, uh, Iron Mike Sharp, the Moon Dogs. they would come to my place, they had all rental cars, and we knew how to disconnect the speedometer, <laughs> and we kind of helped them out over the years, and that paid off too, <laughs> but uh, it was a good time because, you know, again, I'm nobody from nowhere, Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania, who the hell... You know, all of a sudden we're, and then at the same time while I was on television, I'm working at the prison as a corrections officer. Right. And the, you know, hey, wait a minute, is that, <laughs> that our, that's our corrections officer? He's on TV. Everybody wanted to work my shift. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. you you are, I mean, you are currently active today, and you do keep up on the product somewhat today. Somewhat, yeah. We yeah. Uh, we're actually we were just on, I was just on the phone here yesterday with a group out of Shillington, PA or Reading, PA, and uh, my partner and I decided that we're going to do one more retirement show. And I think I'm still active. I'm doing a lot. Dougie, he just he's working out in the gym and that. He lost a few pounds, but he's still big. And I think it's time. Uh, some of the other groups now are kind of sort of touching in, figuring even even Mario, but that's so far to go for a last match. I don't think that's, I don't know, unless just him and I separately as uh, train students back in the day go. But uh, I think we got, we're going to do one more. And uh, like I said, I've been I, at the gym yesterday, still shrugged 720 pounds a couple times and, I figure if we ever stop now, it's going to be over. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll find out. But active-wise, yeah, I talked to Robin Hunter the third. We had him in in a couple of shows as nostalgia and people online on when I go on now and then, and they'll say Kmart suit, which he was noted. <laughs> you know what? When you think about this, I don't know how Mario feels or, or uh, Ron Shaw we traveled together. We did things together. We lived together and we kind of sort our brothers. There's no, <laughs> there's no ifs, ands, or buts. Now, some of the workers over the years were not up to par. Let's just go that way. Okay. And if you interview Mario, ask him about doc, Dr. D. Uh, he's told that? me, he told me he's been on the show before, but uh, we're supposed to do a part two at some point, but he, uh, he's told me about Dr. D. <laughs> So well, I don't know if I, I can I can indulge this, but when we first started, I think I did mention somewhere down the road, I was uh, up against him at Philadelphia Spectrum. Okay, we we were young. I mean, Dave Barbie was there, and like I said, Jim Powers was there. We were all young guys getting into business, and uh, nobody said nothing. I I thought it was a morgue there, and they were doing TV tape, and Hogan was there, and all the big shots were there, and. I go out in the ring, and I'm wrestling just like we did 100 years ago in, in school. And I'm throwing him around a little bit. And then finally he got mad, and he got really mad, and he took his fist, and he made a fist and hit me right between the eyes. And I I went back a couple of steps, and he looked, and I, it's 
there's a video out there somewhere. He puts his hands up and whoa, whoa, and the referee goes, time to go home. Well, I got the knee, went down, went in the dressing room. He comes in storming, cursing and swearing. Who does this guy think he is, this young no good? Tony Altamore is sitting there laughing his ass off on the bench. Hogan comes over to me and he's, you know, you did good, kid. You did good, kid. Everything's good. And this guy's coming over and that guy's coming over. And they're holding Dr. D back. And Altimore gets up and says, see, when I train my guys, they can go with anybody. I thought, I'm fired. It's over. It's done. <laughs> but it it kind of was it, – it was different because, again, with the professionals going to the school and having the big guys of the world there and showing you what to do compared to, like we touched here earlier, about the backyard guys. Somebody's right. going to die. And nobody mm -hmm. cares. And these guys are working for ten, twenty dollars, even gas money. Are you insane? If they're lucky. <laughs> if they're lucky, be trained right. Yeah. And learn how to do everything. And I, I had a school for a while here in Pennsylvania, and my, there were some guys here that I trained that went on, that uh, went to bigger and better things. And they used to get mad at me because when we first started out, like I did with Altimore, we would start to do bumps off the ropes and went up to the next level and the next level and the next, next level where well, you got to learn how to fall first before you do anything. And today, I don't know if they want to learn all the high spots right away. Well, you can't. You got to learn how to go basics before you, again, tell a story. Just tell a story. Whatever happened to the old nerve grip? Yeah, some guys just to do that for break it and then go back, break it and go back, and you know, and it, it's just think about it. It's just a story, and by the end of the night, you do your high spots. It's over. You did your job. It was good. One of the things is that uh, a lot of times in the match, uh, throughout the even, entire evening, some of the guys, uh, it's like the first match is not communicating with the second match. You're going to see the same moves in every match going forward, and that just ends up turning into just, I don't know, to me it's ridiculous. Well, who's, uh, who's fault's that? Well, the guys, I would assume. I would assume the guy in the back running the, the show. Yeah. Because usually in the independence, you'd have a sheet there and who went, when, where, how, and how long and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. You gotta make sure that you're not doing the same move that the other guy just did. Right. It, I mean, we did that years ago up in Maple Leaf Gardens. It was a Paul Orndorff did his finishing move and the guy got up. Mm -mm. Boy, was that a hell of, that was a hell in the cell inside the dressing room. They beat the tar out of this guy. <laughs> you don't you don't get up with our finishing move. But see a lot of these people today, what is their moves? We, they don't do they have a signature move? I don't know. Independence now. Yeah. A lot of guys don't sell moves like the pile driver. You know, <laughs> it's like they'll get and it's just like you're being dropped on your head. <laughs> you you know, it's just uh, to me it's crazy. A lot of moves that, that you know you don't sell the figure four leg lock anymore. Nobody submits really to any moves either. That's, so that's, it's just uh, to me it's just insanity compared to uh, wrestling bad, then and now. Bad training. I'm sorry. That's yeah, the way I feel today because boy, you know even even when I do go in places, I'll show up like there's a show coming up the twentieth here and two weeks or whatever down close by in Slatington and the small ones are running it now. They're off a junior has a place up here now. And uh, when I go into those places, they know because we've been around and that you could tell it's almost like two men who the hell would say that? Oh my God. Bruno San Martino, when he was getting old, uh, Bobby the brain Heenan said when he'd walk by a cemetery, two guys with shovels would chase him. <laughs> it's like that when you walk into a dress room, the older guys, it's kind of, oh, there's so-and-so. You know, there's that's what's his name. And that 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 kind of is okay because at least they recognize the younger right. kids there that are just, they're out of it. But there's so many stories. I mean, we could go on for hours and hours, things that happened in my life with the, the uh, newspapers trying to offer me money, the spill of beans on – Dr. George Saharian out in Hershey Park. And there's so many stories that 
we don't have enough hours in a week to go over what I've seen. And with the, the commercials we did and over, you know, it's just, when I think back, I kept everything. I got all this memorabilia. I'm waiting actually for that one show when they're going to show up and say, yo, where's your sheepskin vest and headband and, and your whatever. And it's in the closet and it's staying there too. It'll be something for the kids down the road and grandkids. But, Was yeah. it the lost treasures or most wanted treasures or whatever yeah. it's called? It's very yeah. uh, hyped up show. I think I don't. I don't know how much of that is legit. That's just uh, my you know, opinion on that show. That's ratings. Yes, that one hundred percent. Yes, that is rating. Just like you, your show here, here, here. Now I'm getting a bunch of these people, Jimmy Dio or Eisbach. They're all saying, "What an upstanding guy you are." Oh, well, you know Jimmy Dio, man. We had him on here uh, a couple months back, and. He is a hell of a guy, I tell you. Two hours we went, and we're, I want to get him back on here again. Like uh, His stories were fantastic. I love that guy. Well, that's the guy we're talking to to do our last. He's involved with that one group out there. Uh, regional Championship Wrestling with, uh, what's the Torres something, Torres, right? Ray Torres. Ray Torres, right. Yep. Yeah, and we spoke here. The other, like I said, we spoke, and we're just looking for a bigger venue because people want to come to see our last show, you know, and, we're just waiting here. That might be in July. Okay. okay. We're hoping. We're hoping for July. But, again, the little shows aren't going to generate enough for them. You know what I mean? Right. And I, he said he's got something cooking down the road here. I understand when we first started back in the day, we were doing high schools. We were doing fire companies. And, of course, the big boys got away from that. And now the little groups, the independents, are doing those which I don't see why the big guys aren't because they were always sold out. Pittston right. Army, St. Joe's Gym. I mean, we, <laughs> it was just amazing how the little venues got us to the big boys. Right. And it, it, uh, I don't understand. I mean, maybe the, uh, the terminology isn't there not, along with the, with the thinking process of how do we make that? And I had a promoter's license for a couple of years. And it wasn't worth – it wasn't worth the nutcase here in Pennsylvania because they want state commission once their percentage off the tickets, doctor and attendance gets it's just Vince was smart in that aspect years ago when he got rid of all the licenses. But a few of them still have it. West Virginia, I guess, PA has it. And and that's that takes away from everything because guys are turned away. Some guys come in, they fly them. Roddy Piper, they flew here to Pennsylvania a couple of times years ago. He had no license. He couldn't wrestle. He got paid, but he couldn't wrestle. So what do you do? I mean, that's up to the promoter. Yeah. And the, the organization should have taken care of it beforehand. But it, it's it's a lot different today. And I got a lot of people in that are still with the business. And they're still – it's just things change. Things yeah. Things change. But well, I anyway, love it. I'd love to have you back sometime if you're interested in ever doing this again. Uh, tell tell some more my, stories. We can talk about my counseling profession too there for 12, 15 years. That uh, I tried to get a wrestling show where I worked at the time, and they said liability was not good for the runaway homeless, you know, people like that that were down on their luck, and the violence might have been a bit over the, over the road. But Lo and behold, after about a couple of years there, my supervisor was going to WWF shows. And I said to her, I said, what's going on here? She said, my sister's now an attorney for Vince McMahon. <laughs> oh, so now it's okay. You can go. But we couldn't have brought it in here. And I said, we could have sold it. We could have got his money and sold the show. But and little stories like that, stuff that we touch base on. And then even up there, ask Mario if you get him on. When we first got up there, we met this this family, Leslie Swyman. She used to come to all the big shows in Hartford and, and the Civic Centers and be the ring girl. She would take our clothes from the ring and take them back. Their family was so outgoing, they would have, we would, if we wanted to stay, we stayed. Mm -hmm. They'd have food for us all the time. And I have to give her a kudu because I still we're on touch now and then, not like we used to be. But ask Lenny, he'll tell you all about it. They were such good families. 
they would have the Undertaker over. I mean, it was one of those where a super fan that became a worker. It was great. Yeah, she was really good. Never had no issues. And a lot of times when we were traveling and we were dead, we'd stop off and sleep on the couch or the floor or whatever so we could get back on the road the next morning. But, uh, yeah, I have to ask Lenny. He'll tell you. Oh, yeah. She, right. used to come to the, she used to come to our training evening when, when Tony Altimore, because, again, she was bringing our clothes back. She was good. So if you want to do this down the road sometime, we got an hour in. I'm happy. If yes, you're sir. happy, we can do it again down the road. But now all of a sudden, you know, we're going to get crazy podcasts coming, and <laughs> you were the first. I appreciate that. I want to thank you so much. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, if you want uh, people to contact you or social media, it's up to you. You can throw that out there. They can. Uh, I know there's my partner, Doug Stoll, I guess. I don't know if he – they're all watching your cast, supposedly. And Yeah, uh, I see some people in there. Yep. Okay. I don't know how many are uh, – was Leslie there too? Uh, I don't see that, no. Okay. I don't think so. I know a few uh, contacted me and said, what's the site? Again, I'm new to this, so I just put on what you sent me. So I don't know how if they got. This is going to be up. This is going to be up on YouTube shortly. You know, I'm going to have it up on YouTube. I'm going to have it up on Apple and Spotify. Not so long. Whatever that is. <laughs> how bad you eat it. But uh, this has been different. I mean, I've done a lot of interviews in my time, but this yep. this is way different. Way different. Jamie Brown is in the house. That's what the I've been told in the chat room. So. He's a super. He was a super D number four. Oh, okay. There you He's go. Corrections officer from out in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. James, right. He's a good, good guy. He's another big boy. You never know. You know what? On the, on the end note here, if anybody's going to see this, which uh, I hope for the young kids out there, follow your dreams. You never know what's around that door. And are we going to make mistakes? Hell yeah. But we learn from them. Are we going to make bad mistakes? Yeah, again, we learn from them. This is just the counselor speaking. Because without our dreams, what do we have? Yeah, nothing. Well, you never know. And be nice to everybody out there, even if they're dressed like a bum. They could be the richest, the richest SOB on the planet. And we've seen that in our time, too. Always be nice to people. I'm All right. Good. Thank you. I'm good. Thank you very much for coming. And like I said, we'll do this down the road. And I want to thank you and everybody. Make sure you click that like button and go uh, go follow him. Thank you. All right. Take care. Goodbye. Wrestling fans, promoters, wrestlers, and anyone who enjoys pro wrestling now have something new to be excited about. The Wrestling Fans International Association, the WFIA, is back. WFIA is an association that exists to promote, grow, and support professional wrestling throughout the world. Membership is free. Your membership includes a free digital bi-monthly publication of the Wrestling Fan News newsletter, association updates, voting privileges, and much more. Please go to thewfia.org, that's T-H-E-W-F-I-A.org, and become a member today.